morning. Uh, this is the webinar uh, of Wilfred Maltzpedan Center and Political Capital Institute on China's digital authoritarianism and sharp power influence. I'm uh, Peter Krakow, Director of Political Capital Institute and uh, Europe's Futures Fellow at Institute of Human Sciences and Erste Foundation. And uh, it is an honor for us to organize this event together with Wilfred Martin Center. And I would like to thank uh, Roland Freidenstein, the Policy Director of Wilfred Martin Center, uh, to join us to this event. Uh, Roland is also a long time and vocal observer of authoritarian policies of China within the European Union, but also in the Far East and in the near abroad of, of uh, China. Um, political capital is dealing with authoritarian influence for a longer time. And we recently published a report called Eyes Wide Shut that you can find online uh, that is about the authoritarian influence of Russia, China, Turkey in Central Eastern Europe. Also, we are doing a regional project tackling authoritarian influence in the European Parliament with the support of National Endowment for Democracy. And uh, let me also welcome among the speakers Dimitar Likov, an analyst at the Wilfred Martin Center, um, who wrote a brilliant study uh, on China's digital authoritarianism, its tools, the companies involved, uh, and the export of such digital surveillance techniques and the dangers they pose to the Western world. Uh, also, after Dimitar, will, um, Roland say a few words and Dimitar will present uh, the study. Uh, we will have a roundtable uh, with uh, esteemed uh, experts and renowned experts of China. Both of them are based in Budapest at the time. Um, so we have Tomasz Matura, who is the assistant professor of Corvinus University in Budapest and the founder of Central and Eastern European Center for Asian Studies. And he's also a Hungarian coordinator of the international project China, uh, Qin, Qin Fluence. Um, also, let me uh, welcome Agnes Sunamar, uh, who is the head of research group on development economics at the Center for Economic and Regional Studies Institute at World uh, Economics Institute. Uh, she wrote extensively on economic relations between China and the EU countries and also about Huawei's role. So, uh, hi, Agnes, as well. Uh, and first, uh, without um, yeah, I don't want to keep keep the word at myself. So uh, let me uh, pass the floor to Roland Freidenstein. Roland, please uh, say a few words. Thank you, Peter. And it's with uh, with great pleasure that I'm co-hosting this event with you today. So I'm the policy director of the Wilfried Martins Center for European Studies in Brussels, which is a think tank of the European People's Party. We've been dealing with uh, China and China-related topics for many years now. Um, and I think it couldn't be a more timely moment to present Dimitar's study uh, made in China about Chinese digital authoritarianism um, because of what is going on in Hong Kong right now. And we'll later on discuss this, this situation in more detail. I just want to emphasize here that these are not two separate detached debates, right? We, if we discuss Chinese digital authoritarianism and its sharp power in Europe, um, it, it, that debate is inseparable from the struggle for freedom of the people in Hong Kong, in Taiwan, and in all other places um, where China is trying to apply its sharp power. So what I'm trying to say is this is a deeply political conflict. This is not about geopolitics. This is not about trade or, uh, of course, it's also about this, but it's not primarily about an, a level playing field in trade and so on. This is about the question of democracy versus authoritarianism. So I want to leave it at that uh, with this idea that we're, we're discussing one big thing here. Uh, it's basically China versus freedom uh, and uh, or the Chinese Communist Party versus freedom to make sure that, hey, we're not opposed to Chinese culture or the Chinese nation. Let me emphasize this in the very beginning. Um, so with that, I would like it. I'd like to hand it back over to Peter. I'm very proud that we, we could do this event together with you guys. Thank you, Roland, and it's our pleasure. And um, 
the yeah the original idea behind this event was that i i read the uh, brilliant report of of uh, wilfred martin's center made in china tackling digital authoritarianism and we have the main author here who is dimitar lilkov so i would like to pass over the floor to him uh, who will briefly summarize the main findings of of this very important study uh, on Chinese digital authoritarianism, even within China and uh, in the mainland and beyond, but also the export of these uh, authoritarian practices uh, to European Union and its member states. So, Dimitar, the floor is yours. Yes. Uh, I believe now you hear me, and I, I hope that the presentation is shared right now uh, with all of our speakers. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you to Political Capital for this uh, fantastic opportunity to contribute. Um, I have shared the full link to the report in the, in the chat, as well as my email for any questions. I'm a research officer at the, at the Martin Center. An important caveat before I start, this report was written before COVID-19. So um, the text is relevant as of February. Um, 2020. So I hope that the COVID-19 uh, discussion is going to follow after my presentation. A very quick introduction of, of, of the report and the presentation I'm going to give. I would like to give a general background of digital authoritarianism in China and its impact on people, digital companies, and the overall state strategy for authoritarianism in the digital domain. Um, I would like to cover international influence and the export of the model internationally. Of course, what does it mean for the European Union? and some key observations and policy recommendations. So let's kick off with people and how this system impacts people in China. Just to give you some context, there's close to 800 million internet users in China. Most of them are mobile users. As you can see in the presentation, this is more than the EU and US population together, which gives, of course, fantastic economic opportunities for the population, but it's also seen as a great tool for social management in China. Online censorship is pervasive in the People's Republic of China. There are many uh, people employed to monitor and censor content online. There's also algorithms and uh, software tools which monitor the web. I think the Great Firewall of China is, is something which is public knowledge, the way that China filters its internet. Um, and also Chinese policymakers and their proxies, they also fabricate social media content. A large case, the scale study shows that each year, there's close to 500 million uh, social media posts generated by proxies of the state in order to shape the narrative online and manip manipulate the conversation. Personal privacy um, is almost non-existent in China. There have been recent developments when it comes to private companies and improvement of, of their privacy practices in a way but when we talk about personal privacy vis-a-vis -vis the state, between the citizen and the state, this is a no-go. Uh, there's specific legislation in China for digital companies, for, uh, for even internet providers, which gives direct access of, of the country, if needed, to specific content. Um, so personal privacy vis-a-vis -vis the state does not exist in China. An interesting fact I would like to draw attention to is what the situation with payments and financial technology in China as well. Cash is no longer king uh, in the Chinese society um, and because many citizens don't have an access to bank accounts uh, or credit cards, China in the last decade has decided to skip this step of development and go directly to fintech and financial technology. Paying with your phone, specific apps, even paying with, with facial recognition. And you can see in the, in the global map that China is turning into a global leader in financial technology in, in terms of payments, um, five or six of the major fintech hubs are in China. So this gives great convenience of citizens to pay and to handle their money, but also this gives a fantastic opportunity for the state to monitor transactions and, and, and to have a close grip on what's happening in the financial domain as well. Lastly, mass surveillance. Uh, this is a topic which has, has gained global prominence in, for the whole world, of course. There's more than 200 million smart cameras in operation in China. This figure is expected to double in the next one year. Um, these cameras operate and they have special facial recognition software 
Some of them can even recognize the, recognize the way people walk. Um, and most worryingly, the country has even started uh, collecting DNA samples of parts of the population. There's an integrated national system called Skynet. Uh, this is not a science fiction name, it's the actual name of the, of, the, of the system. So the whole country has an integrated system where facial recognition and surveillance can be compared and people can be traced throughout, throughout every province of China. And finally, I'd just like to draw your attention to the human rights um, atrocities which, which are happening in Xinjiang. This is an autonomous region uh, in China where, where there is a very big Muslim minority and through mass surveillance and through digital surveillance uh, and authoritarianism, they manage to profile, trace people there, put them in specific camps and, and make sure that this Muslim minority is being oppressed with the long term goal of assimilating them into uh, ethnic Han Chinese in, in the future. Uh, another very worrying trend after COVID-19 hit was that uh, they used many of these Uyghur Muslims uh, and they put them in, in factories and manufacturing to replace people uh, who are at home because of the virus. So these people are also used as slave labor in, in China. This is a whole different topic. I just wanted to mark it because I think it's, it's of international influence, importance. Let's, let's move on to the digital domain and digital companies in China. What's at stake here? The country is pursuing a specific strategy of techno-nationalism. Um, it aims for, for technological self-sufficiency within the countries. It has banned numerous digital companies from other countries, let's say um, Facebook or Google, um, and they are pursuing their own national digital champions to provide services for their citizens and their business. Mm. The country um, is notorious for the fact that it's heavily subsidizing its, its uh, state companies. This can come through direct subsidies uh, for domestically listed companies and also through indirect subsidies. The International Monetary Fund um, extrapolates that close to 3% of the Chinese GDP uh, is indirectly given to domestic companies, land resources, energy, raw resources. And when we, we say 3% of GDP, this is close to 400 billion euros, which are going directly or indirectly into national champions. Um, here in my presentation, I, I'm, um, I'm using the term breeding and feeding of national champions, because on the one hand, they manage to isolate international companies from China. So they give fertile ground for, for local champions to grow. They feed them with massive amounts of, of raw um, data. Uh, and also subsidies. A um, couple of final points when it comes to the digital companies. The ownership structure is, is very murky when we talk about China and digital companies. Some of these companies are, they, the, the government has a stake in their ownership structure. For other, co other companies, even if the state does not control them directly, there is a huge amount of party branches within the private companies which makes sure that operations are going as normal and the, the, the government has a firm grip on its operations. A study by the Australian Strategic Policy Institute shows that in companies like Huawei, Tencent, Baidu, there's dozens of party branches within those private companies. Final point, extremely important when we talk about both citizens and companies in China. The national intelligence law of the country and specifically Article 7, and here I will uh, quote directly, China's national intelligence law creates an obligation of Chinese citizens to support national intelligence work. Article 7 stipulates that any organization or citizen shall support, assist, and cooperate with state intelligence work according to the law. So all companies potentially can be asked from the government to contribute to national intelligence. What does it mean for the state? Very quickly, the state pursues this overall strategy of cyber sovereignty. It disagrees with the way the internet is, is governed, the way that West, the Western countries are leading in, in, in internet design and internet values, more or less. So in the last couple of years, there is a specific push for cyber sovereignty, which means that the country and the nation has to have a strict control on internet policies internally, 
and the country should be able to, to develop future governance of the internet through national sovereignty, which is, goes opposite to the current model of open, open internet governance. And China is pushing for this model to be adapted in the United Nations. It, it, it's, it's looking for global allies to adopt the cyber sovereignty doctrine. And in the last couple of years, we, we've seen support coming from different sides. Russia um, um, in 2017, 19, I think, pledged to create its own independent sovereign internet. A couple other uh, former Soviet republics also are looking into these, these options. Um, and, and, and also, this type of, of rationale is, is interesting for other countries. Vietnam adopted similar cybersecurity legislation like, like China, and the country is trying to export these practices to other countries. Which brings me to the second part of my presentation about international influence and export of digital authoritarianism. The Belt and Road Initiative, I, I think this is an, a notorious uh, plan for global development and, and China subsidizing and investing in infrastructure um, throughout the world. There is a specific branch part of the Belt and Road Initiative, which is called the Digital Silk Road. China has invested close to 100 billion euros in countries mostly in Asia and Africa, also in Latin America, for building basically their digital backbone. You can imagine the, the low level of development of technology and infrastructure, let's say in Africa or some Asian countries. So China is tapping with, with money and loans for building infrastructure, um, optic cables, data centers, uh, even 4G and 5G technology some, in some places. Uh, which is great for these countries in terms of development, but also creates a specific type of loan dependency, which China is exchanging for political favors. And also, and this is very important also for Europe, building this infrastructure makes you dependent on China for future support and updates. So China is becoming an embedded player in many, many countries globally when it comes to digital. Also, an interesting trend is that uh, many, many countries are either directly copying legislation from China or China is engaging with their media elites or policymaker elites for specific types of training when it comes to internet legislation, internet governance. We see numerous examples in, in Northern Africa, also in Asia. Just to give you um, two examples, why is this a problem? Um, a point in my presentation is data grab and access to intelligence. In um, between 2012 and 2017, there is a Le Monde uh, investigation by, by the media newspaper that because China built the IT infrastructure in the African Union headquarters uh, in Ethiopia, for, uh, for five years, China managed to surveil and basically siphon data from the African Union because they used Chinese, uh, Chinese software and infrastructure. A second example, which I, I think is, is in a way even terrifying, is, is Zimbabwe. Uh, China is cooperating with Zimbabwe to build their um, uh, safe cities infrastructure for surveillance and for, for um, security. And in exchange, Zimbabwe has agreed to provide China with raw data, which is training facial recognition algorithms to recognize black skin international experts and black faces. International experts are talking about a new form of data colonialism. Which brings me to, to my last point, and, and this is a segue to, to, the, to the European Union um, impact as well. Safe cities and AI surveillance. Huawei and other Chinese companies have developed this overall strategy for safe or smart cities in which they're exporting technology for traffic light management, smart grids, energy efficiency, and also security in local cities with facial recognition software, with data centers, which sounds great when we talk about security and crime, but this is also a way that they're tapping into local infrastructure and making sure that they are the main leading players when we talk about this type of, of, of technology. And bringing the conversation to AI surveillance and facial recognition, look at the leading companies contributing to AI surveillance and the companies exporting facial recognition technology globally. Huawei, ZTE, uh, and Hikvision, they're the biggest companies which are supplying the, these technologies to more than 60 countries globally. The fact that they're exporting surveillance and AI technology doesn't mean 
automatically that this is used for nefarious purposes, but it means that they're trying to become the global player and also uh, seeing the list of people who are recipients of these technologies, they're also helping autocrats uh, uh, basically continue their rule and continue human rights violations in different countries. Maybe you've seen the example of Belgrade in, in Serbia, where there's a thousand uh, smart cameras built by Huawei for a specific safe city grid management system. Um, quickly moving to the European Union, final couple of slides. What does this all mean for, for, for the EU when we talk about Chinese digital authoritarianism? 5G, of course, is a separate topic, which, which is huge, but very, very quickly. When we talk about the 5G infrastructure debate, um, many people say that there's potential backdoor vulnerabilities if Chinese companies are here. I would say that this is not a backdoor vulnerability. This is a front door vulnerability, and this is shared by international um, security experts. When you lay the 5G hardware infrastructure in a given country, you also need this infrastructure to be updated via software. And this infrastructure communicates with the home company. So if China rolls out 5G in, in Europe, Huawei will communicate with Beijing and there will be all, always be open vulnerability gates when it comes to personal data or specific algorithmic extrapolations and potential breaches of national security. And the debate shouldn't be only about Huawei and 5G, because the example I gave of smart cities and safe cities in different international countries, it's also coming to us in Europe. We have many examples of, of in, in Belgium, France, Malta, where local level governments are partnering with Huawei with the idea to build such smart cities and, and software for crime prevention in their own cities. And I mean, you cannot really blame these local mayors or governors for trying to make their communities safer, but this brings a, another layer of vulnerability. Very quickly on Internet of Things devices, IoT, um, the, think about highly interconnected smart watches or, or voice assistants. We see uh, an, an enormous amount of IoT devices coming from China, which are very cheap and very insecure. There's international reports showing that half of the IoT vulnerabilities and cyber hack attacks, they come from these types, they come from China, which are attacking these cheap uh, and vulnerable devices. Um, very quickly, also to remind you that China is behind most of the significant cyber incidents in the last decade, followed by Russia, of course, um, and it's, it's Either China or state proxies are behind these, these attacks. Now, uh, two slides to conclude. Potential problems and national security threats for Europe. I really want to draw your attention to entertainment and convenience. Um, the, the entertainment apps or facial recognition software, which is going to be used by, by our citizens in the future, if it's provided by Chinese suppliers or Chinese firms, this opens up huge national security uh, uh, potential liabilities. Very quick example of TikTok. Maybe you've seen the, the national head of, of uh, video sharing lately. TikTok is owned by ByteDance, which is a Chinese company. And right now, there is an ongoing investigation in the United States by the United States um, Foreign Investment Committee, which is looking into whether TikTok and ByteDance are sharing data with China and also censoring videos online according to Chinese standards. There were specific cases of uh, videos uh, being censored because people were talking about Hong Kong. So I, I would say that in the next couple of years, we might expect app wars um, in, in which different apps coming from China, they, they don't have the specific standard when it comes to security or they're vulnerable when it comes to data. The same goes for facial recognition or Internet of Things devices, as I mentioned. Again, to conclude, infrastructure, 5G smart cities, local partnerships, this is a big vulnerability for the European Union and should be reconsidered on a national security uh, perspective. Competition with stake-backed champions. How can our digital companies uh, in Europe compete with companies in China which are heavily subsidized and funded? It's not a level playing field. This is something which should be taken very seriously.
And finally, uh, the EU loses, lo lo uh, risks losing its global lead in, in AI and quantum computing. Uh, potentially, China can have first mover in advantage in this domain, and we can more or less, uh, there is a chance that we're going to lose the, the cyber race. Very quick couple of final observations. There is no or limited cost for China's aggressive conduct towards Europe. A realist international actor will exploit this dynamic and push this further if this does not change. European system of governance and institutions are unequipped to, uh, to properly respond to the new nature of challenges in a digital domain. And finally, the EU must develop capacities for digital deterrence. I use this specific word um, and, and it's improve its response toward Chinese sharp power. My final slide is the way forward and that the EU needs... Dimitar, sorry. Yeah. Just Dimitar, sorry. Yeah. And having a bit, bit later, I, I would like to ask the other participants and, and speakers to reflect on that and we will come back to you because it will be a final question and it will go to you as well. What you should do. Okay. okay. Uh, so. Uh, thanks a lot for for uh, summarizing this really brilliant study. And yeah, for, it partially contains elements that that most of the readers can be aware of. But I think it's a really uh, comprehensive and good overview of all all these uh, topics. And if if you just read this report, that uh, I highly recommend to all of our viewers. Um, I mean. Black Mirror seems to be a fairy tale compared to what is the uh, reality, the dystopia that that uh, uh, we live in, and and mostly Chinese citizens are are living in. So, Roland, I would turn to you now, and one short question related to all of what Dimitar has been talking about. How, what do you think the pandemic? Um, uh, resulted in, in terms of China's influence, both in the digital domain, both more generally in the in the sharp power domain. So we could see a quite uh, intense disinformation campaign from China with, with uh, in some member states, <clears throat> mainstream political parties amplifying it. We could see a strong mass diplomacy. Do you think that China's uh, influence in Europe can rather be stronger after the pandemic or, or it will rather be, become weaker? Okay, in a nutshell, um, I think, I mean, first of all, the jury is still out on this, right? It is probably too early to tell, but there's a couple of indicators. The, the, the one important one that I want to start with is that uh, China, in trying to use what itself perceives as soft power, shot itself in the foot. Uh, the, the, the COVID-19 crisis, the pandemic, and China's action, actions during it have vastly increased criticism of, of China, of the Chinese Communist Party in Europe. They're, and and, and they, they are creating now a pushback. Um, and we, we'll go into detail later on. But second, you know, because the European economy is so hard hit, by the way, the American one too, but, but focusing on Europe, our economy is so hard hit. Uh, China, China's too, but it looks like China may work itself out of uh, the, the recession, the depression, uh, into a recovery faster than Europe. And so the fear is that whatever we feel and think and even say, about Chinese power in Europe, um, uh, we are going to be too broke to be resilient. To quote a friend of mine, Jan Techau from Berlin, um, he, he, who says that, you know, whatever we want, we, we, we risk that we're just too poor to resist Chinese shopping sprees of strategic infrastructure, Chinese shopping sprees of people. I mean, buying people, it's called elite capture, I think is the techno technical term here. Um, so so there, are, there are two developments that are actually diametrically opposed. And which one will carry the day will decide over whether China will be successful. But both of these developments are accelerated and intensified by uh, the pandemic.
Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks, Roland. I, I think it's it's a very important point, and we talk less about that. That the yeah, uh, the lack of economic growth will uh, will be able to even increase this kind of economic dependencies that that already pretty much exist towards uh, towards uh, China. Agnes, uh, my next question would be to you. Um, you you wrote some studies about Huawei's expansion in in Europe and and all over the world. And what we could see in, in Dimitar's presentation is that Huawei is is becoming a leading exporter of uh, AI uh, surveillance and face recognition techniques. How much you think is is a real threat, and how much you think Europe is is uh, how to say equipped to to face with this challenge? I wouldn't call it a, a risk, I would call it a challenge, but this is just one challenge uh, uh, the company or this whole digital power of China can pose to Europe. So I think that, that we should differentiate between at least three or even four fields. So we can talk about political challenges arising from this digital power of China or, or arising uh, digital power of China. Security can be mentioned as well. Ideologically, Europe sees quite a lot of challenges from this as well. And also we can, we can mention the economic challenge, of course. And if it's security challenge, I think that we have to differentiate again between the uh, more traditional network type of challenge or cyber security challenge, if you like it. And also we can, we can call it uh, the other challenge, geopolitical challenge in, in the field of security. So I think that we are talking about quite a lot of challenges in this field and and it seems that uh, the one we are just talking about right now is just only one of them so i think that this is what uh, makes this challenge a huge one that it is just part of a big story and yes when it comes to for example uh, non-eu central and eastern european countries it seems that they are uh, much more committed towards China nowadays. And those are those countries that sooner or later can be members of the European Union. So even if there is a common stance on China in the EU, there is no common stance on China in the EU right now, but even if we could reach a common stance on China, sooner or later we will let some other countries in who will be already quite closely committed to this new digital power. So I think that this is the main challenge here. Yeah, what what we could see, for example, um, when there were some uh, uh, protests against uh, President Vucic and and some of his measures in in the streets of Belgrade, then uh, face recognition cameras uh, given by Huawei and by uh, China to to um, to Serbia were used to identify the 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 protesters and then we could see scenes like we can see in Hong Kong get, that people went on the street with, with face masks and and uh, some face paintings that can uh, can make it more challenging for these cameras to identify them but but it, it clearly showed what what you you are saying that that uh, even in the countries that would like to join in the European Union and in most of these countries the the impact of China could be uh, even stronger um, Tomas, uh, sorry, one, one, we received some question from the audience that I would just like to briefly respond to the, on the definition of, of, of uh, sharp power. The sharp power is a term that was invented by researchers of national endowment for democracy. And what do they mean by that is the use of manipulative, diplomatic, and technological and political and information uh, policies by one country to influence and undermine the political system of, a, of another country. So in a lot of cases, we, we see um, examples. And, and why, why this term was invented? Because uh, researchers found that the term soft power does not really describe well the nature of, of uh, authoritarian influence these days, because the, the aim of the influence is usually not necessarily to make the uh, the source country uh, more loved and more sympathetic and more popular. For example, when it comes to Russia, um, but partially to China as well, uh, Russia and China are rather becoming uh, more unpopular within the European Union, but it does not mean that they cannot extend their influence through information policies, through disinformation, through uh, corruption uh, of, of uh, political uh, parties and, and through um, 
manipulative diplomatic practices. So hope hope uh, I could a bit clarify uh, the term itself. And right now I would jump back to the panel and and to uh, uh, next question would be to to Tomas. Uh, Tomas. Uh, um, how much do you think uh, Central Eastern Europe uh, was rather vulnerable to the mass diplomacy and and the to the more intense sharp power uh, campaign of of China uh, after the beginning of the uh, COVID nineteen crisis? And how much do you think that the Central Eastern European region could be should be treated as a region? Can we observe similar uh, uh, controversies and different approaches towards China? within Central Eastern Europe, like we can observe towards Russia. For example, that Poland is way more hawkish than, for example, Hungary or, or Slovakia. Um, there, was, there was, for example, a Huawei executive who was, uh, who was arrested in, in Poland. Still, on the other hand, we can see that, that uh, even in the region, there are quite a lot of positive statements about uh, how to welcome Chinese investments. So how, what do you think about, to narrow the scope a bit of the vulnerability of uh, the Central Eastern European region? Well, I think that uh, the current crisis and the way China reacted to it uh, means a major setback to Chinese influence in Central and Eastern Europe. So, uh, as you alluded to, many people have been thinking that uh, Central and Eastern Europe is falling into the trap of China and is getting closer and closer to China, and Chinese influence is on the rise in Central and Eastern Europe. On the contrary, what we have been observing in the past few weeks and months is that uh, in Poland, in the Czech Republic, and for example in Slovakia, uh, the current governments uh, nurture a very, very different view about China, and they are going against Chinese will, and they are trying to get closer back to the West, and in particular to the United States of America. So you just mentioned Poland. Uh, it was the first country in the region to react to American interest and American request to uh, get Get rid of Huawei. We see similar patterns in the Czech Republic. The Czech uh, nation has always been one of the most critical ones about China in the past uh, 30 years. And nowadays, what we see again is that the Czech Republic is going pretty much against China's interest. At the very beginning of the coronavirus crisis, uh, Prime Minister Babish even refused initially to send any kind of equipment to China because he was expecting that those equipments would be needed in the Czech Republic. Today, there are major scandals in the Czech Republic about uh, the um, uh, defective Chinese masks and, um, and the virus kit te test kits in the Czech Republic. So this is once again an, uh, an issue what uh, means a major setback to Chinese influence in the Czech Republic. Later, China made some mistakes. So for example, the Chinese embassy in the Czech Republic sent a letter to the president, President Zeman, threatening with um, uh, economic sanctions, uh, practically sanctions sanctions against the Czech Republic should one of the higher ranking Czech um, uh, politicians visit Taiwan. In Slovakia, the new uh, Slovakian uh, government uh, seems to be quite uh, strict about China and Slovakia was only second to the United Kingdom to sign an open letter criticizing Chinese actions in Hong Kong. I think uh, 27, maybe 27 Slovakian members of parliament and other foreign policy experts signed that open letter more than in the United States of America. And then we have some other issues, for example, Serbia on the other end of this spectrum, where today you can see billboards, huge billboards on the streets of Belgrade saying thank you brother Xi Jinping uh, and uh, uh, President Vucic himself sent a letter to President Xi Jinping and he referred to him as his brother, brother, personal brother and the brother and best friend of Serbia as a whole nation. So over there what we see that the European Union has made some mistakes, forgot about to help Serbia at the very beginning of the crisis and China was very very swift to fill the gap and to uh, and to fill this vacuum and send a lot of equipment to Serbia, and it worked well uh, over there. And of course, we have you know a very special country in the region, as always, Hungary. So on the one hand, Hungary you know should belong to the Visegrad countries. On the other hand, uh, when it comes to China, it, it tends to behave more like a country of the Western Balkan, like an non-EU member state. So uh, when it comes to the Hungarian-Chinese relationship amidst the coronavirus crisis, I can say that its business is 
usual. Uh, I think if we, if we look at Hungarian communication, government communication, you can find zero uh, China blaming, of course. Still, China is a very important partner to Hungary. Uh, it's also very interesting how the Hungarian government has been communicating about all the medical equipment we've been purchasing from China. Uh, those who speak Hungarian, you know, there's very few people, uh, those who speak Hungarian might be surprised to see that the Hungarian government in official communication has never mentioned the price of uh, what we paid for the medical equipment. Even grammatically speaking, when, when you look at this communication, verbs are never used that we bought, we purchase, or anything like that. All the medical equipment from China is the delivered, it, it is arriving, it comes from China, but no amount of money has ever been mentioned. And that's a very strange thing I cannot really understand the reason for. So generally speaking, I think that the Chinese influence in Central Europe is crumbling. Uh, at least on the short run. So uh, we can see a decline over there, especially in EU member states. In the Western Balkan is strong and it has always been strong, but that's a different question. However, in the long run, I would not, uh, uh, um, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't dare to say that China will lose eventually its power in Central Europe because of the coronavirus. Because there is one thing the Chinese have been building very, very, uh, um, is in a very sophisticated way and that's personal relationship on every level of the society. So right now I'm working on a paper what is analyzing um, uh, Chinese events and any kind of networking in Central Europe in the past decade and what I found that in the past decade the Chinese have organized more than 600 Central Europe China related events either in Central Europe or in China ranging from the meeting between the chancellors or presidents of the Central European Central Banks to the meeting of elderly dancers of China and Central Europe. And it might sound a bit funny, but uh, if, you, if you know the Chinese, you know that the Chinese, they always build so-called one she first. So relationships and networks, they build friendship first and then they do business. And if we uh, consider this fact that the 600 events in the past 10 years could have reached thousands or even tens of thousands of people of Central Europe. First of all, the elite, the economic and political elite, but also, you know, average people, I think we have to face the fact that China is building the long term presence in our region. Thank you. Okay, thank you for providing such a detailed uh, overview in, in, in this short time on, on the very different patterns of, of influence in Central Eastern Europe. And yeah, I, I think it's it's indeed very important what you underlined that we differentiate between um, the, the different countries in, in Central Eastern Europe. Also, it's a recent development that, that uh, according to uh, South uh, China Morning Post, the uh, Hungarian government was uh, in line with the Chinese government, was opposing that Taiwan is sharing its experiences on its very successful fight against COVID-19 with the WHO, which raises many questions. It was something that appeared in the Chinese press and the, uh, let's say, uh, critical press towards uh, China, but it did not really appear in the Hungarian press. So there are questions of transparency here as well. Uh, I would um, go for a next question to Roland, and then we have good uh, questions that are mainly targeting uh, Tomas and uh, Tomas's and and uh, Agnes's uh, topics. So my my question would be because this is something extremely um, how to say hot topic these days that uh, we cannot uh, we shouldn't only talk about this European influence because there are. Uh, there are important developments in Hong Kong and in Taiwan as well. In Hong Kong right now, there is a bill right now that is seriously threatening the one state, two systems solutions, and there are renewed protests in, in Hong Kong. Plus, uh, the United States um, threatens with some sanctions uh, as well. And in the case of, of Taiwan, uh, that, that seems to reject the one state solution. Uh, the central government of China has recently raised the possibility of uh, violent, let's say violent reunification. Uh, and, and army leaders are talking about this pretty clearly. So it seems that the tensions are definitely on the rise in this uh, more democratic 
regions within or outside uh, China. So, uh, Roland, you, you were in Hong Kong and in Taiwan as well, if I know it well. So you have first-hand experiences. What do you think the outcome of these conflicts could be? And, and what does it mean for, for United States and Europe? Well, you know, it's, it's impossible to overestimate the, the, uh, the importance of what is happening in Hong Kong right now for the entire world. Uh, and what uh, also is happening in Taiwan and might in future actually happen in Taiwan, um, all this is part of one big struggle. Um, and it's, you know, as you cannot separate technology from business, uh, sorry, technology from politics, as we heard from Dimitar, you, you cannot separate uh, uh, business from politics. And you certainly cannot separate what is going on in Asia from what is going on in other parts of the world. So to put it in a nutshell, what's happening in Hong Kong right now, um, I mean, there were many people who argued that already last year with the behavior of the uh, Hong Kong government vis-a-vis -vis the protesters, uh, the principle of one country, two systems was dead because even then, uh, the Chinese Communist Party and the government in Beijing heavily intervened in Hong Kong, pressuring the government to be tougher on the protesters and so on and so on. You know, gestures of, uh, of bullying, of, you know, a troop, uh, uh, a, 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 a troop deployment at the, um, at the border between mainland China and Hong Kong and all these gestures. Uh, that means that the spirit of one country, two systems was already dead. Now, today, we can say even the letter of one country, two systems is dead because China is openly violating the agreement of 1984 on the basis of which uh, Britain returned its colony Hong Kong to the People's Republic in 1997 and agreed that for 50 years after that, um, sorry, is it 50 or 30 years? I forget. Um, um, whatever. Uh, that that for, for several decades after that, Hong Kong could govern itself and would actually maintain the rule of law. It would nominally be part of the People's Republic, but governing itself and maintaining essential human and civic rights. Now, this is put, this is right now, as we watch, being put out of, uh, out of practice. Um, so, so it's not only in spirit and, and in, in, in content, but also in letter, a basically a, a, a fundamental violation of an international agreement. Um, and uh, I mean, this is something that should not go unanswered uh, by the European Union. That also bodes ill, of course, for the treatment of Taiwan and its uh, citizens by the Communist Party, uh, because you know, if they deal this way with Hong Kong, completely uh, violating international agreements, they might, they might actually, in a couple of years, violate the fundamental rights of the, of the uh, uh, 27 million Taiwanese citizens who want to maintain their liberal democracy that they have, that they have built um, since, uh, since the end of uh, uh, what was called martial law in 1987. Um, so, uh, you know, we, it, this is all one gigantic struggle uh, between authoritarianism, which is unfortunately financially and technologically very savvy, uh, and the, the people who struggle for freedom. And let me, let, me, let me add one last remark on Hong Kong and Taiwan. You know that one of the mantras of the Chinese Communist Party is that hey, you guys in the West, you can have your parliamentary democracy. We think it's dysfunctional. We think it doesn't work. I mean, look at Trump, look at Brexit. But that's your business. If you want to shoot yourselves in the foot, fine, right? That's the rhetoric we get. Because I haven't, I, I've, I've primarily been to, to, to the People's Republic, by the way, and I know these, I know that rhetoric. So, and the second sentence they say is, but hey, as far as East Asia is concerned, and especially... Chinese speaking uh, places like Taiwan and Hong Kong. Listen, your Western democracy is alien to us, right? It doesn't fit into our culture. It's not part of our civilization. 
This rhetoric is being proven wrong every single day. When we look at the one and a half million people uh, out of, out of, uh, 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 out of, I think, four and a half million Hong Kong citizens that take to the streets and risk their careers, their personal well-being, their liberty, in some cases, even their lives for freedom. And the same story, the same, the same thing is true for Taiwan. Taiwan is a functioning liberal democracy in a Chinese speaking country with a Chinese culture. So this is my plea. Whenever we hear that criticism of the Chinese Communist Party is anti-Chinese and that Western democracy is only Western and doesn't fit into China, Let's call out this bullshit because that's what it is. Okay, thank you very much uh, for these principled uh, statements. And uh, we, we have three questions. I, I would throw uh, to each three panelists one of them. One uh, is directly connected uh, to, to what you just said, Roland. So how, uh, the question is, how can legislation in Hong Kong be resisted? Who is already trying? Are any Western businesses doing anything? Uh, and and I, would, I would connect one question to that. What do you think about the US response of, of changing the relationship? Will it rather help Hong Kong or will it just rather undermine it uh, economically? And, and will it rather be a cure or, or curse to withdraw this special uh, uh, trade status of Hong Kong um, with the bilateral relations? Uh, is, is that to me, Peter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's to you. Great. You're the Hong Kong guy. I'm, a, I'm proud, <laughs> proud to be the Hong Kong guy here. Uh, all right, thanks. Um, so, first of all, business in general. Well, I mean, I'm, I have no illusions about the fact that Europe, and not, not least of all my own country, Germany, we're already to a to a, a scary degree, economically dependent on China, um, especially in the economic slump which, which, uh, which accompanies and follows the, the, the pandemic. Uh, you know, I mean, where are, where are Germans going to sell their Porsches and their BMWs if not in China these days, or Volkswagens for that matter, right? Um, because no one is buying in Europe at the moment. Um, so, uh, so, Yes, there is a degree of dependency. And at the same time, I think we have to become more independent. And thank God, the voices that advocate a higher uh, independence from the Chinese market, as well as Chinese deliveries, not only in pharmaceuticals and, and masks, and uh, also in technology, by the way, look at Huawei. Uh, it, I think we also have to become less dependent on the Chinese market in consumer goods in general. It doesn't mean we don't try to sell anything anymore. Um, uh, we can also buy t-shirts from China in the future. Uh, I don't think there's a problem with that, uh, as long as they don't have chips built into them. But, but generally, I'm, my prediction is that business with China will not completely stop. We, I don't think... Uh, we will be able to completely decouple from uh, economic cooperation with China. Uh, but it will be on a much lower level and will be much more selective than it has been so far. And there, there will be an economic price to pay for this. I'm totally aware of this. But I'm afraid that um, in our own long-term, not only political, but also economic interests, we will have to pay that price. Okay, now as far as the Hong Kong question is concerned, very briefly, look, um, is the US move to, to stop the, the special treatment of Hong Kong, um, is this going to help the people of Hong Kong or, uh, or is it ultimately going to be a, a stab in the back for them? The jury is out. We don't know. It's much too early to, dis to, 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 to make a judgment about this. There are some Chinese diplomats which have reacted with glee, uh, you know, kind of poking fun at the U.S. and saying that, yeah, well, uh, you will have to drink the bitter medicine that you've prepared for yourself. You know, this flowery Chinese language. Um, 
So, uh, it, you know, because e even, even before the COVID-19 crisis uh, last year, when, when the riots, when the protests started in Hong Kong, um, there was a theory that China is actually not unhappy about the, uh, what they would perceive insecurity in Hong Kong because they want to replace Hong Kong by Shanghai and make Shanghai the, fin the financial hub uh, which is connected to the whole world and uh, brings in brings in cash and brings in investments from other countries. Well, the point is that Hong Kong's selling point was its rule of law. Uh, the the fact that companies could not just be um, treated the way companies are being treated on the mainland. Um, foreign Western companies are being treated on the mainland with Communist Party cells, with forced technology transfer and all this. So I, I do understand the American point uh, uh, to an extent because, you know, with the security law, uh, this selling point of Hong Kong risks disappearing. And yet we have to critically examine whether we aren't stabbing the people of Hong Kong in the back with this. So this needs to be a careful calibration in the future. Okay, thank you very much. We have some other brilliant questions. So we already responded the question of Andras Bozoki on on uh, on the terminological clarification. Hopefully, the, uh, you right now gave a response to Anas Bona at Business and Human Rights Resource Center. There is a, another very good question from Dusan. Komarcevic, that, uh, sorry, let me first go with another one from Botond uh, Bet, uh, Betush, who, who, who would go, which would go to, to Agnes. So why are we talking about Serbia or non-EU member state countries regarding to China or Huawei when Hungary already entered China and Huawei in European territory? So if we can, uh, Agnes, if you can give a bit of outline about uh, what is um, Huawei's actual influence in Europe that Dimitar also have talked about, then it would be a nice response to this question. Well, I think that, that Hungary is not the only one that will open up towards Huawei sooner or later. So Perfect. for the first, uh, well, right after the, the, the US uh, uh, trip to, to some of the Central and Eastern European countries in order to convince them to not to uh, uh, cooperate with Huawei. There were quite a lot of uh, tough responses that, okay, we don't want to engage with Huawei on, on developing 5G networks, but later on, quite a lot of countries started to rethink the question, and it was not totally uh, independent from the fact that the Germans did the same or the Germ Germans are doing the same to be honest. So as we have already heard from Roland there are still uh, some uh, uh, negotiations and disagreements even even among the governing uh, 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 parties. So uh, I think that if the Germans would be able to make a clear stance on this that would at least help for those countries such as Czechia for example that are more on the US side in this. I mean, more on the let's block Huawei uh, fully. But there are some countries who are already considering just uh, uh, partially limiting, uh, using the UK example, for, for example, that, that letting them in, but trying to keep an eye on them at least. And there are of course countries such as Hungary who decided to not to limit the, uh, the presence of Huawei in, in 5G development at all. And I don't want to demonize Huawei here. So I don't want to say that they will definitely do some uh, spy game here or, or, or anything, but, but I think that that would be a much better uh, to have a joint toolbox here, at least in the EU. So that would be a lot better to, at least share information with each other, share practices with each other, and, and for example, try to expand the investment screening mechanism uh, to this field, so as we can have uh, a more common stance on this as well. Okay, thank you very much. And 
we have another uh, question from uh, Dushan Komarcevic, uh, which first part goes to my input and a bit of clarification and, and correction. Hello, uh, my name is Dushan Komarcevic. I'm journalist at Radio Free Europe from Belgrade. I just have one short note and question. Note, first Huawei cameras were installed in 2019 in Belgrade, but they are not in function yet. Serbian Ministry of the Interior prepared assessment of the impact of mass video surveillance on the protection of personal data, but it was not accepted by the commissioner for information of public importance and personal data protection. This legally prevents the use of this system. Thanks for the clarification. Hope it will remain in place. One question then, uh, which is mostly connected to what Tomas was talking about already. Uh, um, how strong is the impact of China in Western Balkans? And what are the biggest threats for the Western Balkan countries in that sense? So, uh, Tomas, if you can respond briefly to this very broad question, we would be grateful. Yeah, sure. I already offered a written response in which I mentioned that uh, uh, huge Chinese loans, uh, I think, posed a major threat for Western Balkan countries. So two years ago, a colleague of mine from Bosnia and Herzegovina was very proud to announce that uh, his country was taking a loan worth to 4 billion US dollars, what is kind of a quarter of the total GDP of, of Bosnia and Herzegovina. So it can lead to um, a situation where countries, uh, prospective members of the European Union uh, in the Western Balkan could be bought up by the Chinese or acquired by the Chinese in the long run. Of course, the good news is that these economies are so small that should the EU or the West in general decide to push the Chinese out, it could be done easily with a relatively small amount of money. Uh, and what I forgot to mention in my written response is something more serious, and that's uh, the impact of uh, the Chinese influence in the fields of politics or the mindset of the people, the heart and the minds of the people. Because what we see today that um, China decided to spread its model around the world, what is a major surprise given the fact that for uh, 30 years China uh, had been denying the pure existence of the Beijing consensus or a China model. And a few years ago, uh, President Xi Jinping started to talk about a Chinese model and he even mentioned that China is ready to share its experience with countries around the world which want to experience uh, strong and fast growth economic development without uh, taking the burdens of the West, uh, like democracy, human rights, uh, freedom of speech, and so on and so forth. And I think this is the biggest challenge the Western world and the international system, as we know it today, has to face since the Cold War, the worst years of the Cold War. And some Western Balkan countries and their people and their elite, first of all, might be uh, an easy victim for for such a Chinese attempt to convince them that the Chinese system is superior to the Western system because, you know, people just simply look at GDP growth and it, seeming, it seems like that the Chinese are more successful, but people are not aware that it's unfair to compare uh, the GDP growth of a developing country with the GDP growth of, uh, of a mature economy like the Western European economies or the United States. So I think this is something we have to be very careful about. But uh, I don't want to blame the Chinese always, so let me blame the European Union for a moment. Because the European Union, this is, this is a situation what we see today where China is not winning, the EU is losing and America is losing, the Trump administration is losing. So we have been making so many mistakes that it made the situation very easy to the Chinese to, to, uh, to, to utilize the mistakes of the Western European countries uh, or the European Union and of America. So on the first hand, the European Union should have never let the Western Balkan down. We have forgotten about them a little bit. Just think about the huge disappointment uh, in, in Serbia and in other Western Balkan countries when the European Union a few months ago decided not to pursue their accession uh, uh, negotiations uh, and uh, everything has been slowed down. So I think that's another thing we have to keep in mind that we have, we the Europeans, we have some issues to deal with in the Western Balkan and we have some uh, duties uh, to, to, and we have some tasks to fulfill in the Western Balkan. <clears throat> Thank you, Tomas. And um, 
I would connect two questions and, and uh, throw them on, on Dimitar. Uh, one is uh, from uh, Yehuda Lukács from uh, George Mason University, uh, who, who, whose question is that, is China's globe tech penetration is a function of emerging opportunities worldwide, or is there a master plan that was developed years ago and now we are witnessing its implementation? Important question. Other one um, from an anonymous attendee, how would you evaluate the middle ground approach to the adoption of China's 5G networks? For example, imposing restrictions uh, on more sensitive areas, using strong cryptography and then to end the encryption. So Dimitar, very briefly, uh, could you give some response to that? Thank you. Uh, thanks, great questions. On the first one about the master plan, I wouldn't say that this master plan existed for decades. I would say that the strategy for tech penetration came after Xi Jinping uh, more or less uh, came to power. Uh, before that, China and its internet governance was really uh, focused internally, how to contain internet internally, how to build companies, how to manipulate the discourse internally. But after Xi Jinping came to power, there was a, a specific push for um, improved administration, for improved efforts, and for global penetration of, of Chinese tech players. So I would say 2013, 2014, this is the breaking point when China started to think about global export of this. On the second question um, of the middle ground, maybe the, the, um, uh, the person who's asking the question is referring to Britain. They, they managed this formula of 35% um, of, of, of a network should be Huawei and core infrastructure shouldn't be, shouldn't be um, given to Huawei. I'll be quite hawkish on this. I would say that uh, Europe has to recognize 5G as critical uh, infrastructure. Um, the Danes, by the way, Denmark is, is going in, 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 this, in this direction. And I think that we should really think about uh, European players such as uh, Nokia and Ericsson when it comes to building these networks because of the national security implications. Thank you very much. Um, and I, I would have a... Sorry, sorry, Peter. Can, can I yeah. just... just uh, Please do. What, what Dimitar just said. Uh, because there was also uh, Agnes uh, asked about Germany and the, 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 the pivotal role that it seems to play also for other EU member states in the, in the Huawei 5G question. Uh, as far as I know, Merkel is still on the course that uh, at least Huawei should be a legitimate competitor for equipping uh, Germany's 5G. And uh, otherwise, she also kind of, against the advice of her own services, by the way, her own security agencies, um, that uh, like in Britain, we can somehow separate the core from the periphery and, and you know, keep an eye on them, uh, uh, but take them in. This is now, I think, in, also in the wake of COVID-19, this is more and more frontally assaulted by her own parliamentary group, uh, by the Foreign Relations Committee um, in the Bundestag. Um, and, uh, and I think it is, it is becoming increasingly unpopular in German public opinion. So I can't predict anything, but I see signs of a change in the German attitude also on Huawei. And this is very important what Dimitar said. You know, it's not enough just to block. We have to... Uh, 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 cultivate our own industrial champions, and these are obviously Nokia, uh, Nokia and Ericsson in this case. And it's, it's going to take more time, it's going to cost more money, but uh, you know, our essential, essential freedoms should be worth it. Thank you very much. And uh, it, it leads us perfectly to our final really short round of questions. Thank you for all the attendees for the really brilliant and, and thought-provoking uh, questions. My last question would be for each of you that uh, as, as a final um, remark that um, and, and it's coming also to the German approach. The One of the priorities of the next chairman uh, uh, European Council Presidency is going to be EU-China relations, and surprisingly, or surprising to me at least, um, Chancellor Merkel was rather harsh when, when she um, highlighted uh, her approach, saying that um, 
the America made a clear plea for a strong European approach towards China, which she said was necessary because of Beijing's determination to claim a leading place in the existing structures of international architecture. And these issues are ambitious enough in themselves. So it's not a very hawkish statement, but, but definitely a, 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 a dedicated shift from the previous typical uh, German approach. So if you were uh, the consultants of the German presidency or uh, let's say the European Council in general, what would be the one, uh, one thing that you would propose to Chancellor Merkel and to the German presidency or EU, EU institutions in more general? So what do you think the one thing should be that, that the EU uh, is, is stepping forward in normalizing its relationship or let's say putting it a different ground with, with China? So. Let's start with Agnes, maybe. It's a, it's a very difficult question, to be honest. So I know. <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> so maybe if I will, would have a, a week to think it over, I would be more smart than this. But I think that that without unity, uh, unfortunately, it is it is not really possible to to reach a common stance. And the EU is is already fragmented on its own. So even without this whole 5G issue, so I, I don't see at least yet any step, if you want me to, to say only one thing, that would help to create this unity. Uh, but just a unitarian approach would be able to somehow, if not block, but rather, but, but at least limit uh, this challenge. Thank you. I think the point on, on unity is extremely important. One of the suggestions that we, we made in, in our report is that the, the anonymous decision making in foreign policy is something that must be, let's say, uh, probably changed in the future and the qualified majority voting in the European Council on Foreign Policy issues might be a bit better when it came, for example, to the South China Sea conflict, Greece and, and Happy was, uh, Greece and Hungary were vetoing a, a quite critical statement of EU members States and it happened in, in some other cases as well. So it's, I think unity is definitely something crucial. Uh, okay, Tomáš? I think the strategic approach of the European Union is going towards the right direction. So I, I would have a very technical uh, recommendation that we need a strong and really unified uh, investment screening mechanism. This issue has been on the agenda of the European Union, but as always, the European Central Authorities have been very weak, so everything has been watered down, and today uh, national governments tend to dominate this, this question. Uh, I think we need it on a European level, something uh, similar to the American CFUs Committee. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Dimitar? Yeah, I, I, I fully uh, subscribe to what Agnes and especially uh, Thomas just uh, just said when it comes to investment screening and overall overall approach. I'll just remind remind key stakeholders that we like to talk about multilateralism, that we like to preserve the interests of our businesses uh, because of the the, the, the the strength of the Chinese market. But here we are confronted by a realist, international, aggressive actor, and I think that our response should also be realist, and we should more or less um get in get in touch with the realities of 21st century okay thank you and roland final words are you yours thanks peter um well my advice to the german presidency would be to to of course increase resilience and th this has so many angles from uh, from investment screening to uh, uh you know keeping out digital authoritarianism to promoting industrial champions and so on but uh I think we, we also need to think hard about the foreign policy mechanisms, that with this decision-making mechanisms. Majority voting has been, has been on the cards for a long time, uh, at least as part of the debate. Um, well, two things. First of all, I don't know whether we're going to get it anytime soon. And second, even if and when we get it, it will not solve all the problems. We will still have individual countries, especially big countries, uh, going their own way. So I think to offset that, what we need is coalitions of the willing. Uh, uh, you know, we, public opinion is shifting about China. Um, uh, uh, parliaments are shifting, political parties are shifting, think tanks are doing their job, just like yours and ours, uh, in trying to 
to change the discourse on EU-China relations. And, and, and governments will be somehow at the end of that chain uh, a kind of uh, make, taking, uh, taking the correct uh, conclusions from that for their, for their policies. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's not a black and white uh, change from one day to the next. It's a long process. But the pandemic has, has accelerated it. Just two more remarks here. Um, you know, one thing that we need to, we need to be aware of uh, is the problem of, these, uh, of the rhetoric that China is already winning or that China is losing. Um, you know, this totally reminds me of 2014, 15, 16 about Russia. We have both these extreme opinions, sometimes from very well-meaning people. Yeah. You know, uh, Ed Lucas uh, kept saying Russia is winning. I think that this rhetoric is dangerous, just as it's dangerous uh, to say China has already lost. Um, no, uh, we are somewhere in between these extremes, and that's the only way to keep us away from complacency on the one hand and defeatism on the other, because both are attitudes that we cannot afford in this. We have a fighting chance. As long as there is not uh, two million people marching through the streets of Brussels or Paris or Berlin or Budapest, demonstrating for one party rule, I think we stand a fighting chance in this systemic rivalry. And, and the last thing I wanna say is something that came up again in this debate about Hong Kong and the EU reaction. It's this alleged dichotomy between values and interests. I've always attacked this as a false dichotomy. Uh, you know, uh, I would say values are long-term interests. Because, I mean, if we give in, if we appease China, as it has unfortunately happened a couple of times just in recent weeks by the External Action Service of the European Union, if we could keep on appeasing China, we will not safeguard even our narrow economic interests and our well-being, let alone what should be much more important to us, which is our, our fundamental freedoms. And so, uh, you know, values are long-term interests. Thank you very much. And, and yeah, hope, hope Roland, you will prove right in, in that uh, this pandemic will be a wake-up moment uh, in, uh, for not just for think tanks and, and journalists and the opinion, public opinion, but also for, for national governments. But you're, you're, you're right that we, we can already see some signs of that. So thank you very much for, for Wilfred Malta Center for co-organizing this, this event for us. Thanks, Roland. Thanks, thanks Dimitar. Also, thanks for our wonderful other speakers from Budapest, uh, Tamás and Agnes. Uh, thanks for all of you for staying with us during this conversation and raising uh, brilliant questions. And also thanks for my invisible helping hands in the background and my, my colleagues, Katalin Sitash, Shabba Molnár, Patrick Siherle, who helped to uh, prepare this, this event. So, um, Stay with us with the with the next next events as well. Follow the Wilfred Martin Centers, follow political capital, and wish you a nice day and then a weekend. Goodbye. Perfect. Thank you.